Okay. This is chapter 12 of the book. Isaiah 53 in the day of the Lord. God's book. He dictated it to me. He had me put it together. Every word, every sentence, every paragraph, every chapter. And in the title. It's all his. Every bit. Of I don't take credit for one bit of this book. But I had the knowledge that's in it. He taught it to me before we typed it up. As blogs. One at a time over the years while he was teaching me the scripture. As he teaches Ezekiel. But it's, you know, it was written for antiquity. He says, Ezekiel, eat this scroll. Ezekiel says it was like honey. And God says, now go tell the people, the exiles, my words. So that was him teaching Ezekiel. Divine inspiration of prophecy fulfilled. This is Matthew, book of Matthew, first book of the New Testament. Chapter 4, verses 13 through 17. And leaving Nazareth, he, Jesus, came and dwelt in Capernaum, which is upon the sea coast, in the borders of Zebulon and Nepetalim. It's kind of like northwest corner of the northern kingdom. I think that's right. That it might be fulfilled. That it might be fulfilled, he says, which was spoken by Isaiah. That's Isaiah. The prophet saying, the land of Zebulon and the land of Nepotelum, by the way of the sea, beyond Jordan, Galilee of the Gentiles. The people which sat in darkness saw great light. And to them which sat in the region in shadow of death, light is sprung up. From that time, Jesus began to preach and to say, Repent, for the kingdom of heaven is at hand. That's Matthew 14 through 17. This is what it actually says, and there's no Jesus in it. They have actually put Jesus into the Hebrew Bible by repeating a prophecy of Isaiah, which, which really, it's not so much prophecy as this is, is, is a historical note of what was going on at that time in his life. He was in the kingdom of Judah. This is what it actually says. Isaiah chapter 8, verse 23. For if there was to be any break of day for that land, which is in straits, only the former king would have brought a, ba a basement in the land of Zebulon and in the land of Naphtali, while the latter one would have brought honor to the way of the sea, the other side of Jordan, and Galilee of the nations. Nations means Gentiles in the Hebrew Bible. This is not a prophecy to be fulfilled. And it has nothing to do with Jesus. It is more of a plagiarism they did, Matthew did, altered to fit Jesus into the Hebrew Bible. This is a statement in the last verse of chapter 8 concerning the coming defeat of the northern kingdom of Samaria, also called Ephraim and Israel, by the Assyrians, which did happen. And Isaiah witnessed it. That ends chapter 8 regarding the northern kingdom, and then chapter 9 begins regarding the southern kingdom kingdom and an exaltation of the birth of King Hezekiah of Judah in the southern kingdom. He was thought to, he was going to be a great uh, a great king for them and, and they needed it because the Assyrians were staring straight at Judah. matter of fact they even laid siege to it but uh, it was later on the Babylonians finally defeated Judah. I think the Babylonians defeated uh, the Assyrians and then the Chaldeans, who are mentioned in the Hebrew Bible, uh, 
defeat Babylon. I, I think that's how it goes. Okay, here's what it says. The very next, it, it, the end of chapter 8, and then the beginning, verses 1 through 5 of chapter 9. The people that walked in darkness have seen a brilliant light. You see how this is being plagiarized? On those who dwelt in a land of gloom, light has dawned. You have magnified that nation, have given it great joy. Okay, that's not because Jesus is there. Like Matthew makes the prophecy saying, they, <clears throat> they have rejoiced before you as they rejoice at reaping time, as they exult when dividing the spoil for the yoke that they bore and the stick on their back. The rod of their taskmaster. You have broken as on the day of Midian. Truly, all the boots put on to stamp with and all the garments donned in infamy had been fed to the flames, devoured by fire. For a child has been born to us. A son has been given us. And authority has settled on his shoulders. He has been named the mighty God is planning grace. The eternal Father, a peaceable ruler, planning grace. The mighty God is planning grace. Judah wants God to stop the Assyrians from defeating them. And this says, this child's very name is God's planning grace for you. In the ninth year of Hoshi, the king of Assyria captured Samaria. He deported the Israelites to Assyria and settled them in Hala, at the river Habor, at the river Gaza, and in the towns of Medea. It's 2 Kings chapter 17, verse 6. The king of Assyria brought people from Babylon, Kutta, Ava, Hamath, and Sepharim. And he settled it. That would be from the Middle East somewhere. Huh? By Babylon, Iraq, Iran, somewhere in there. And he settled them in the towns of Samaria in place of the Israelites. They took possession of Samaria and dwelt in its towns. So the northern kingdom was now inhabited by Gentiles when the exiles returned. Matter of fact, the Gentiles tried to stop the building of the second temple in some ways. The Isaiah chapter 9 verse 1 verse is an exaltation of the birth of King Hezekiah of Judah in the southern kingdom. The Assyrians were now threatening Judah, which is why there was a great exaltation of the birth of Hezekiah. This is not a prophecy of Jesus dwelling in Capernaum and that a great line has been seen by the people living there with Jesus beginning the preaching of repentance. Jesus has nothing to do with this verse. It is about kingdom and kings, defeating and deporting the Jewish people and importing Gentiles to the northern kingdom in chapter 8. And in chapter 9, the hope that the newborn heir to the throne in the southern kingdom of Judah would be a great king, graced by God to lead Judah as a peaceable ruler in dangerous times. One verse is about the northern kingdom, and the next verse is a new chapter, and it's about the southern kingdom. The versions have nothing to do with one another. Or with Jesus. Verses of the Hebrew Bible lifted out with the statement to fulfill the prophecy of Isaiah. He's got a lot of statements about prophecy fulfilled that are false in Matthew. It's full of them. Well over 10. Lifted out and made a part of the Gospel of Matthew with the words that it might be fulfilled, which was spoken by Esaias the prophet. The story of Jesus has nothing to do with the Hebrew Bible. The writer of Matthew tells his readers a prophecy has been fulfilled by Jesus. By the way, if you see me looking down here, these are God's words. If I'm looking up and talking, those are my words, but. They seem to always follow or come before. 
The writer of Matthew tells us where your prophecy has been fulfilled by Jesus and combines two verses changing their meaning and context and includes an act of Jesus to make it seem as though Jesus was in the prophecy. That the prophecy of Isaiah includes Jesus preaching repentance. From the days of the writings of the New Testament through the Middle Ages, the world was illiterate for the most part, and very few people had access to the scrolls of the Hebrew Bible or could read the Greek translation of it later and then translate it to English. No one could examine the veracity of the unknown writers. That's not the disciple. Nobody believes that's the disciple Matthew. He's too learned. Uh, that's in here. Well, I'll get to it. Uh, that's true of all the disciples. They have Gospels. There's three of them. Luke. No, Luke was the historian. Mark. Anyway. It wasn't the actual disciples. No one could examine the veracity of the unknown writers of the Gospels and determine if a prophecy was really fulfilled and relied on religious leaders' assertions that they were written by divine inspiration. The Gospels, whoever wrote it, was written by the Spirit of God. There's nothing divine about this passage in the book of Matthew. It is intentionally written to mislead the reader. It's the last paragraph. Today, there is a new complete translation of the Hebrew Bible into English that is far superior to the Hebrew to Greek to English translations that make up the Holy Bible, Holy Bible's Old Testament, they call it. Much easier to read and comprehend. It is the Jewish Publication Society's 1985 to not. It's got to be 85 because before 85, they did what uh, a lot of organizations do, including Tobia Sanger, Jews for Judaism, Shabbat, uh, Art Scroll. They're relying on translations that people try to fix the translation from older books. Not necessarily going to Greek and then to, but, but possibly that is it. And I've explained that plenty of times. 1985 that is used in this book and Jesus has nothing to do with the Hebrew Bible. The Christians should just rip that Old Testament out of their Bible because they have it, it, there is nothing in the Hebrew Bible that is prophetic of the coming of Jesus. Nothing. And when they find out he can't be Isaiah 11, Moshe, or Messiah, and he cannot possibly be Isaiah 53, which is covered in this book and in the videos, can't possibly be. It was written that way because God knew what they were going to do. And he knew what was going to happen the day of the Lord when the righteous servant was truly here, Moshe, and the prophet like Moses. We just got to get a voice. I got to get the backing of the Jewish people. And then God says, this is how it gets done. Just keep, keep putting the book out there. That's your proof. Not everybody's going to believe it. Few will, in fact, compared to how many uh, Jewish people there are in the world. And again, in Israel, only 30% are observing, according to the last survey. And 53 is not necessarily on the top of that 30% agenda. You know, not everybody's interested in it. So it's a small market, and uh, the topic is, is, I guess, I don't want to say small, but, uh, but there's nothing small about the day of the Lord. Okay? There is no Messianic here. This is what you get. God's coming back. God will place his temple among you. You'll be safe on your own soil. And you will no longer be the taunts of the nations. No Messianic era. No world exaltation. The world is not going to be spent <laughs> talking Hebrew. Two billion Christians are not going to disavow Jesus. Two billion Muslims are not going to disavow Allah. And come say, the Jews been right about God all along. He's the God of Israel. And basically, we want to convert. Not going to happen, people. But that's what your rabbis teach. And that's why, when I, that's why, and it's in the Hebrew Bible, when I'm here, Moshe, he has a reckoning with all the shepherds 
and dismisses them. They are all dismissed before God right now. They will not go into the Malachi 3 scroll of remembrance. They will not see the Jewish heaven unless they help me straighten Judaism out with this book. And that's why it's hard to get published. It looks like an attack on Judaism. It's not. It's to bring Judaism into the modern era and stop teaching foolish things like world exaltation. It's just not going to happen. Jews weren't formed for that purpose. They were formed to test the world and the world faith. That every last Jew is going to go through the experience of being a Jew from here to the end of time. Okay, next up, chapter 13, God creates and he forms. And this is interesting because it tells you, and this is God's writing, tells you where the word Jew came from. It doesn't come from Judah. It's not some derivation of Judah. 